Hello, it's Scott Manley here. When the Dragon spacecraft flies to the ISS in a couple of weeks, it'll be the first US-built spacecraft that performs a splashdown since the days of the Apollo program. The space shuttle, of course, landed on runways. The last Apollo flight was the Apollo Soyuz test program in July of 1975, and that would be the last time the US performed a splashdown. But it wasn't the last time that humans have performed a splashdown after returning from space. That questionable honour belongs to Soyuz 23. Now, while the Soyuz spacecraft is designed to land, well, on land, the plains of Kazakhstan do have lakes. Soyuz 23 was crewed by Vyacheslav Zudov and Valery Rostestvensky, uh, and in October of 1976, they were supposed to go to Salyut 5 for a planned mission time of two to three months. This was expected to set a new record in long-duration spaceflight. It would be a return to the space station, which had been abandoned by the crew of Soyuz 21 in an emergency where the atmosphere had got contaminated. Salyut 5 was internally known as OPS-3. It was the third and last of the military ALMAZ stations, which had different designs from the civilian Salyut stations. The launch occurred in high winds, and there was a lot of concern that the winds might cause the vehicle to rock far enough to trigger the launch abort system. But the launch vehicle managed to punch through the bad weather and inserted the spacecraft into an orbit that, while lower than planned, was still able to perform a rendezvous with the station. A day later, the crew were on final approach and began docking operations. But the automatic IGLA docking system malfunctioned. The crew recognised there was a problem and after disabling the system, they wanted to perform a second docking attempt. However, the low initial orbit and the abnormal manoeuvres had depleted their fuel, leaving insufficient margin for both a docking and landing. So, the docking was called off. The spacecraft had only a few days of supplies on board, so return was scheduled for the next evening. The retro burn, separation, re-entry and parachute operated as designed, but where instead of landing on the plains of Kazakhstan, they splashed down in Lake Tangiz in the middle of a brutal snowstorm. So the possibility of water landing had been anticipated. The capsule was designed to float on the surface to allow recovery, but the waterlogged parachute acted a bit like a sea anchor, and with the wind, the capsule was pulled over onto its side in the freezing water. This left the hatch partially submerged, which meant the crew could not open it without flooding the spacecraft. Outside, the conditions were not ideal for recovery. A blinding snowstorm with high winds and temperatures of minus 20 Celsius. Even if the crew had extracted themselves, they would have frozen quickly. The first recovery teams arrived in helicopters, helped by guidance from reconnaissance aircraft. The capsule was about 120 kilometers from its intended landing spot, and the flight to this was made in complete darkness because when they turned on the lights, all they saw was a blinding snowstorm. When the helicopter got close enough that they could pick up the guidance of the beacon, they realized that it was very likely in the middle of the lake. And apparently one crew member made the joke that this was because Rostisvensky was a sailor. Nobody laughed at that joke. It was a serious situation. Initially, they were able to establish communication with the crew by radio, who confirmed that they were in the water and they were instructed to ensure that they were wearing their wetsuits for the recovery. Because of difficulty moving around in the small capsule as it was rocking, the crew ended up using knives to help get off their pressure suits so that they could change into their other gear. In the thick snowstorm, the helicopter initially overshot the capsule, but eventually turned around and got close enough to see it floating on the surface of the lake. The weather meant that the pilot was unable to hold position over the spacecraft, and as fuel was depleted, they flew to the shores to land and wait for supplies. Some of the recovery teams set out in inflatable boats to try and get to the crew. So Lake Tengiz is an inland sea. It's very shallow. Its average depth is less than three meters, and its deepest point is less than 7 metres. It's much, much saltier than the oceans, up to 200 grams of salt per litre of water, as opposed to 35 that you might get in the oceans. This is so salty that there's no fish that live in the lake. And also, even at minus 20 centigrade, it wasn't, didn't form a sheet of ice on the surface. There were slushy patches of ice on the surface, 
but um, and those had to be negotiated by people in boats. They also had to negotiate the marshlands along the shore, but through all of this, one boat did actually reach the capsule. This was crewed by one of the helicopter pilots, Nikolai Chernovsky, but when he got there, he found that the situation had worsened. The salty water had got into the spacecraft and had triggered the backup parachute system, which had deployed and then dragged the capsule further over. Now the antenna were underwater, so radio communications had ceased, but more worryingly, the ventilation port had moved below the waterline, so the crew could no longer exchange air with the outside. The spacecraft still had life support, but on battery power they couldn't operate it for long, and the crew were in real danger of asphyxiating before they could be rescued. Chernovsky would stay, uh, choose to stay the night with the crew, communicating them with them as best he could. And for this, you know, he did actually suffer severe frostbite and lost two of his fingers. As the night wore on, the storm cleared, the sky began to lighten as dawn approached, and more rescue crews arrived, now with clear weather and better equipment. Uh, a helicopter flew out to the capsule, and a diver examined it. He confirmed that the crew were still alive, but there was no way that they could bring the capsule upright so the hatch could be opened. Instead, it was decided that they could tow the capsule to shore using the helicopter. Now, initially, the commander of the helicopter refused this because the rules explicitly forbade this kind of operation, and pilots couldn't be ordered by superiors to break these rules. However, the case was made that this was the only solution, and the consequences of not doing this would be the death of the crew. The pilot accepted the task after making sure that he had witnesses who would confirm that he was being ordered to break the rules. Apparently there had been tests of this towing manoeuvre and they understood how fast they could tow the Soyuz without risking the hatch being opened by water pressure. It was a slow journey across the 7 kilometer trip to shore, flying at low altitude, risking overheating the engine, and as they get closer to shore, the reserve parachute caught the wind and inflated. The force almost dragged the helicopter into the water, but the pilot's quick reactions managed to save the situation. And even with the extra drag of the partially inflated parachute, the capsule finally made it to the shores of the lake. Rescue workers were quickly able to get the hatch open and get to the crew before even the helicopter had landed, and the crew of the capsule were carried out on stretchers, frozen and suffering from the effects of the carbon dioxide poisoning, but they were alive thanks to the heroic efforts of the rescue teams. As of right now, we don't know for sure how long the first Crew Dragon mission will be, but I expect that when it returns to Earth, the recovery teams will have a much easier time than the Soviet rescue teams did. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.